Section 7 of St. Augustine by Louis Bertrand, translated by Vincent O'Sullivan. The second part, The Enchantment of Carthage, Amare e Amare, quote, to love and to be loved, end quote. Confessions 3, 1. 1. Carthago Veneris, quote, I went to Carthage where shameful loves bubbled round me like boiling oil, end quote. This cry of repentance, uttered by the converted Augustine 25 years later, does not altogether stifle his words of admiration for the old capital of his country. One can see this patriotic admiration stirring between the lines. Carthage made a very strong impression on him. He gave it his heart and remained faithful to the end. His enemies, the Donatists, called him, quote, the Carthaginian arguer, end quote. After he became bishop of Hippo, he was continually going to Carthage to preach, or dispute, or consult his colleagues, or to ask something from men in office. When he is not there, he is ever speaking of it in his treatises and plain sermons. He takes comparisons from it, quote, you who have been to Carthage, end quote. He often says to his listeners, for the boy from Little Thagast to go to Carthage was about the same as for our youths from the provinces to go to Paris. Veni, Carthaginum. In these simple words, there is a touch of naive emphasis which reveals the bewilderment of the Numidian student just landed in the great city. And, in fact, it was one of the five great capitals of the empire. There were Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Alexandria, Carthage. Carthage was the seaport capital of the whole western Mediterranean. With its large new streets, its villas, its temples, its palaces, its docks, its variously dressed cosmopolitan population, it astonished and delighted the schoolboy from Madara. Whatever local marks were left about him, or signs of the rustic simpleton, it brushed off. At first, Augustine must have felt himself as good as lost there. There he was, his own master, with nobody to counsel and direct him. He does indeed mention his fellow countryman, that Romanianus, the patron of his father and of other people in Thagast, as a high and generous friend who invited him to his house when he, a poor youth, came to finish his studies in a strange city and helped him not only with his purse but with his friendship. Unfortunately, the illusion is not very clear. Still, it does seem to show that Augustine, in the first days after his arrival at Carthage, stayed with Romanianus. It is not in the least improbable that Romanianus had a house at Carthage and spent the winter there. During the rest of the year, he would be in his country houses round about the ghast. This opulent benefactor might not have been satisfied with giving Augustine a good tip for his journey when he was leaving his native town, but may also have put him up in his own house at Carthage. Such was the atonement for those erroneous misfortunes of antiquity. The rich had to give freely and constantly. With the parceling out of wealth, we have become much more egotistical. In any case, Romanianus, taken up with his pleasures and business, could not have been much of a guide for Monica's son. Augustine was therefore without control, or very nearly. No doubt he came to Carthage with a strong desire to increase his knowledge and get renown, but still, more thirst for love and the emotions of sentiment. The love prelude was deliriously prolonged for him. He was at that time so overwhelmed by it that it is the first thing he thinks of when he relates his years at Carthage, quote, to love and be loved, end quote seems to him, as to his dear Alexandrian poets, the single object of life. Yet he was not in love, quote, but he loved the idea of love, end quote. Nondum, amabam, e amare amabam, amare amons. Truly, never a pagan poet had hitherto found such language to speak of love. These subtle phrases are not only the work of a marvelous wordsmith, through their almost imperceptible shades of meaning may be described an entirely new soul, the pleasure-loving soul of the old world awakening to spiritual life. Modern people have repeated the words more than enough, but by translating them too literally, quote, I love to love, end quote, they have perhaps distorted the sense. 
they have made Augustine a kind of romantic like Alfred de Musset, a dilettante in love. Augustine is not so modern, although he often seems one of ourselves. When he wrote those words, he was a bishop and a penitent. What strikes him above all in looking back upon his uneasy and feverish life as a youth and young man is the great onrush of all his being which swept him towards love. Plainly, man is made for love, since he loves without object and without cause, since in itself alone the idea of love is already for him a beginning of love. Only he falls into error in giving to creatures a heart that the Creator alone can fill and satisfy. In this love, for love's sake, Augustine discerned the sign of the predestined soul whose tenderness will find no rest but in God. That is why he repeats this word, love, with a kind of intoxication. He knows that those who love like him cannot love long with a human love, nor does he blush to acknowledge it. He loved, he loved with all his soul. He loved to the point of loving the coming of love. Happy intimation for the Christian, a heart so afire is pledged to the eternal marriage. With this heart of passion, this lively sensibility, Augustine was a prey for Carthage. The voluptuous city took complete hold on him by its charm and its beauty, by all the seductions of mind and sense, by its promises of easy enjoyment. First of all, it softened this young provincial, used to the harder country life of his home. It relaxed the Numidian, contracted by the roughness of his climate. It cooled his eyes, burned by the sun in the full flowing of its waters and the suavity of its horizons. It was a city of laziness, and above all, of pleasure, as well for those plunged in business as for the idlers. They called it Cartharjo Veneris, Carthage of Venus, and certainly the old Phoenician Tanit always reigned there. Since the rebuilding of her temple by the Romans, she had transformed herself into Virgo Coelestis. This virgin of heaven was the great Our Lady of Unchastity, towards whom still mounted the adoration of the African land 400 years after the birth of Christ, quote, strange virgin, end quote. Augustine was to say later, quote, who can only be honored by the loss of virginity, end quote. Her dissolving influence seemed to overcome the whole region. There is no more feminine country than this Carthaginian peninsula, ravished on all sides by the caress of the waters. Stretched out between her lakes on the edge of the sea, Carthage lounged in the humid warmth of her mists, as if in the suffocating atmosphere of her vapor baths. She stole away the energies, but she was an enchantment for the eyes. From the top of the impressive flight of steps which led up to the temple of Escalapius on the summit of the Acropolis, Augustine could see at his feet the huge, even planned city with its citadel walls which spread out indefinitely, its gardens, blue waters, flaxen plains, and the mountains. Did he pause on the steps at sunset? The two harbors, rounded cup shape, shone, rimmed by the quays, like lenses of ruby, to the left, the lake of Tunis, stirless, without a ripple, as rich in ethereal lights as a Venetian lagoon, radiated in ever-altering sheens, delicate and splendid. In front, across the bay, dotted with the sails of ships, close hauled to the wind, beyond the wind swept in shimmering intervals, the mountains of Rhodes raised their aerial summit lines against the sky. What an outlook on the world for a young man dreaming of fame! And what more exhilarating spot than this Mount Byrusa, where, in deep layers, so many heroic memories were gathered and superimposed. The great dusty plains which bury themselves far off in the sands of the desert, the mountains, yes, and isles and headlands, all bowed before the hill that Virgil sang and seemed to do her reverence. She held in awe the innumerable tribes of the barbaric continent. She was mistress of the sea. Rome herself, from the height of her palatine, surged less imperial. More than any other of the young men seated with him on the benches of the school of rhetoric, Augustine hearkened to the dumb appeals which came from the ancient ruins and new palaces of Carthage. But the supple and treacherous city knew the secret of enchanting the will. She tempted him by the open display of her amusements. Under this sun, which touches to beauty the plaster of a hut, the grossest pleasures have an attraction which men of the north cannot understand. 
the overflowing of lust surrounds you, this prolific swarming, all these bodies, close pressed and soft with sweat, give forth, as it were, a breath of fornication which melts the will. Augustine breathed in with delight the heavy burning air, loaded with human odors, which filled the streets and squares of Carthage. To all the bold soliciting, to all the hands stretched out to detain him as he walked, he yielded. But for a mind like his, Carthage had more subtle allurements in reserve. He was taken by her theaters, by the verses of her poets and the melodies of her musicians. He shed tears at the plays of Menander and Terence. He lamented upon the misfortunes of separated lovers. He shared their quarrels, rejoiced, and despaired with them. And still he awaited the epiphany of love, that love which the performance of the actors showed him to be so touching and fine. Such then was Augustine, given over to the irresponsibility of his eighteen years, a heart spoiled by romantic literature, a mind impatient to try every sort of intellectual adventure in the most corrupting and bewitching city known to the pagan centuries, set amidst one of the most entrancing landscapes in the world.